Akira uh, Mayami, uh, the Japanese scholar who uh, came up with this notion of not industrial revolution, but industrious uh, revolution, uh, in his interview with Alan McFarland, the uh, Cambridge anthropologist, said that he listens to um, uh, Beethoven's Ninth uh, Symphony once a month, and he particularly favors the conductor uh, Wilhelm uh, Fort uh, Wengler, uh, the German conductor. Uh, this gives um, another dimension to the analysis uh, that we're carrying out already in the sense that uh, music as um, seen by the uh, composer is considerably different as seen by a conductor who has to instantiate it in uh, um, particular conditions. Uh, the conductor therefore more resembles a technician or engineer and the composer has seemingly uh, more freedom within the um, network of uh, musical um, possibilities which however are um, not totally unlimited but um, more make one think of uh, mathematical uh, possibilities uh, rather than technical physical instantiation of something that can only happen once. Uh, the score sits there um, in a way that it can seemingly uh, out of its essence, which may, uh, which as I guarantee you have to understand is out of its essencing, um, not from eternity, but from wherever this which we uh, should describe as, which we still can seemingly describe in this um, Entscheidung or in this uh, uh, split between the instantiation by the conductor who has to deal with particular muse musicians and has to have the music actually performed in some place and the one who first conceives of the music and then um, brings them, as it were, out of the soul and puts them on paper in the form of the um, musical notation. Um, so I was just trying to get to uh, the part about rehearse this uh, common theme of the uh, apology of Socrates as one place where we can see the discrimination between uh, Gluck and um, on the other side uh, Freud or between in a certain sense um, this uh, wisdom on the one side and uh, something like uh, the sound engineering sense of um, uh, the conductor's sense of uh, what can be done with the material in a specific, specific um, or particular um, uh, time and place. Um, somebody has to put on a, a theatrical performance of um, Strindberg's Dance of Death, Part 1. Um, they have the actor um, Laurence Olivier, who thinks that the uh, play is um, to be put on a very serious, somber tone. And then he's shocked to discover that um, other performances have already been put on in this in a sort of um, wild and uh, almost comic tone in, uh, in Europe, in continental Europe, rather than uh, England. Um, so that it becomes clear that from the same script, we can have different uh, uh, insubstantiations uh, from the same uh, symphony score. The conductor can, if it's Glenn Gould, that he can do take the possibility of the score and even, as it were, um, 
in the extreme case, somehow go back into the region of uh, the composer as the conductor. This is um, something in, I want to bring into question here. Uh, we have in the um, Apology of Socrates, which uh, following Strauss, I learned from Strauss to um, point out that this is the only Platonic Socratic uh, dialogue with the name Socrates in the title. Such um, incidents are worth um, pointing out simply because they may yield fruit in some way that we don't know, just having uh, being aware of these details. Um, it's true that we don't necessarily know if later compilers have um, put these titles on or whether the titles are original to Plato um, and other um, considerations, that just in passing. Uh, the main point here is that we get a um, distinction between what can be done, Socrates as the phronomos or as the man of uh, who knows how to handle himself in any situation in Athens, more or less, and then this notion that there could also be somebody uh, who has a more uh, sort of uh, Wu Wei or um, sage-like, uh, Wu Wei being a Taoist Dao um, way, um, sage-like uh, sense of uh, how to enter into the flow state of things or how to do things in such a way that they're superior to any reproducible wisdom in any or any teachable wisdom which could be regularly instilled as can the art of writing, as can the art of um, arithmos or uh, basic um, addition, subtraction, division, multiplication in, in almost all uh, human beings. Um, how far can we go in the direction of things which only occur rarely and only by, um, as it were, uh, gluck, itself so that there's occasionally there's a passionary occasionally there's someone who um, can do things that are um, high and far above uh, the ordinary um, on the other side but this would be something that would affect everyone but it would just not everyone would be able to gain an original insight into what was happening and therefore um, you can derive from that, for instance, the notion that you have a, a Fuhrer or a guide or um, a Hitler, for instance, in, in the um, sort of failed um, attempt at it, where the Prussian people or the German people have produced um, this guide out of themselves, or it, Hitler may have been a false guide, it's just somebody claiming to be a guide and not actually substantiated. Um, that's debatable, but um, that such a figure is available and that it's actually um, not so far-fetched because we have in every field of human endeavor or every human pursuit, there's some people that are uh, sometimes uh, almost infinitely better than everyone else at it. And that's not, um, that's, and we can all see that just by looking at um, any human pursuit, whether it's music, mathematics, um, astronomy, um, even, I suppose, uh, people that have a real sense of uh, grammatical questions, there's probably some geniuses um, in that field, too. It's true of every human pursuit. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, Zizek, who hates uh, wisdom, who hates anything out of the ordinary, and this uh, coincides perhaps to a slight extent with his French education. Zizek was not um, in the low University of Paris schools, which were unaware of how the soup is made, so to speak, because he was at the Col Normale Superior. If you're at the uh, Polytechnique or something like that, you're just getting indoctrinated straight out, so you don't really know how the, um, the sausages are made. But the people like Derrida or um, Zizek who saw how the sausages were made nonetheless can't help but uh, probably be in some way 
uh, brought into the fold of that uh, love of that form of things, which is to say um, nobody is uh, special, laissez-faire, um, there's no um, outside of the um, uh, things that can be at least potentially taught to everyone um, and so forth. And then you'll get this notion, somehow the praise of love as sort of radically individual personal love rather than as love of the idea seems to be connected to that. So then the, um, there's somehow a connection between that and the um, Freud. Uh, and uh, if you read the whole of Schiller's voice, uh, Schiller's uh, verses in there, you see part of this um, celebration is also this uh, bourgeois kind of celebration of personal life becoming uh, grander and uh, more godlike, as it were. Um, so there's a complex of issues in there. Uh, I say without giving any uh, details, but just uh, as a society, I think in some way Heidegger has tried to overcome this um, straddling uh, positions, these distinctions. Um, so how else can we... Uh, look at that in a way where we can gain some purchase on some orientation on these issues. Where does it come out in daily life? Um, well, let's look at, remind ourselves of one fact, that it's clear that in Nietzsche's version, Wagner has slipped away from this universalist project, which, um, so that has a paradoxical place in Dugan's thinking, for instance, because uh, enlightenment universality he's against, but enlightenment universality has tipped towards this specific kind of personalistic bourgeois uh, version of um, liberation and of uh, the sublime, which is not the um, the is not uh, sort of the Socratic um, version, but uh, something almost particular to. Uh, the French, the French, and the the lapsed the Catholics, the Catholic countries that became secular countries. Um, while this spoke to the whole of Europe, um, it then degenerated into the nationalism, which Dugan is uh, constantly laboring to show that he's against. And when it degenerated into nationalism, then you got the Gesamtkunstwerk uh, notion which, um, although in artistic circles and in the general usage in the FTE, for instance, it's used to mean uh, some kind of performance that involves um, people on stage, uh, uh, singers, um, uh, painters, or whatever, all kinds of artwork. But that's not what Wagner meant by it. What Wagner meant was something like uh, for the German nation, a music which was a vehicle which could bring you into an understanding similar to the way music was used in the Catholic tradition of um, Palestrina or um, Bach to bring you into the right uh, Stellung or the right um, mood as it, or the right attunement to um, transcendence and to the particular transcendence of the Catholic uh, spirit. And this he wanted to do for a much narrower version that no longer spoke to the whole of Europe, as Nietzsche um, describes it. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's obvious if you just listen to um, a little bit of Bach, a little bit of Palestrina, Beethoven, and then you listen to Wagner. This is totally, this is an attempt to be more narrow and more intense and more, um, partic it's an attempt to show a national spirit, not a um, uh, sort of um, this monarchia version. This not a, not a sense of a global uh, universalism, but under a specific, under the Italians or under some specific headquarters. Um, so there's that move, which Nietzsche says is a kind of failure at what he's calling the grand 
style. And those all, I would say, fall on the one side of uh, attempts to um, transcend this, uh, what, what Dugan is putting forward as the rise of nominalism, because the everything that um, attempts to look at forms directly, um, form means, for instance, a chair, why are we put things together all in one group? Because they're all alike, and then you say, but what's alike about them? Well, because they're all chairs. So the mind and the, uh, the physical thing are not separated in the idea of a form. But when there becomes a problem with discovering forms that are adequate for life, then you get all these uh, degenerations, especially when it has to do with the form of justice or the form of a government or the form of the, the customs of daily life. Um, what else here? On the one side, uh, you have a question of how the university. So there's a uh, that's the um, the point I wanted to get into, which is more uh, tangible, which is that question of um, Scott Buchanan and the great books uh, question of is it so that there's a sound, we can make a sound distinction between philosophic questions, which are basically disinterested in, in the normal sense, in the sense of trying to uh, acquire wealth or so forth. Um, and uh, the political questions. So that you could say that freedom for the university would mean freedom to pursue these philosophic disputes, such that uh, Plato would have won out against uh, Cicero. You know, Cicero wrote this um, De Republica, this um, answer to uh, Plato saying that um, if you're ultimately going to be worried about the political disputes, why don't you uh, put that in first place immediately and try and forget about the distinction? Um, whereas Socrates is saying you can have a, a position of discussing things which is free of interest, at least free of interest in the vulgar sense. Um, I'm more inclined to that view myself um, because I think even if there is an asymptotic uh, difficulty in the region of rationality or ratiocination or the soul itself, the soul not as a uh, geist, not as um, the soul rather than the body, but as uh, that which is not primarily concerned with uh, the life of the um, in the city, but is concerned with the life more with the life of the forms, um, and has a passion. In other words, there, that there's a passion for thinking, which is we can distinguish from the passion that a Donald Trump has, or the passion that a Joseph Biden has, or the passion that a. Um, um, uh, entrepreneur has, or the passion that um, somebody, Elon Musk, concerned with some um, going to space or some other project, or solving some particular um, housing problem or something. Um, that that reason has a specific uh, domain, and that do that domain is uh, not specific in an ordinary sense, but it's. I'll put it this way: the philosophers originally. Uh, we're not doing philosophy, but they were just the people that were found at the university saying, we're looking for knowledge. So that there's a specific domain of looking for knowledge, which covers all the things that later on became um, the seven uh, liberal arts and the disciplines and everything. But later on, and as in our own time, is degenerated so that it appears like one of the disciplines alongside others and and then also one of the the least important ones um so in the sense that all pursuit of knowledge is given the name philosophy this i believe and therefore also reason rationality uh, however you want to call it um this i think still has 
even if it's vexed within itself, still has a, a ground above uh, philosophy which can be um, adequately distinguished so that people that can move freely within it can see that distinction and um, um, that it that it's something that they can exercise and it's real. So in this sense, it strikes me that the clear example would be if you had in a kind of super university, people like Dugan and Zizek, who I claim are moving in that space of uh, what we call reason, we'll just use the ancient term reason or uh, ratio or however, um, even though they talk about political issues quite a bit, they can still be seen as having this split, which we then can attempt to uh, give a clearer description to and, and find out what are its, um, what's going on in it and why this split exists uh, and provisionally pointing towards um, some old enlightenment ideas Zizek is still uh, clinging to in a way. Um, and on the other hand, uh, uh, I think Dugan and then um, I'll also say myself in my own way are more on a different, uh, uh, something different speaks to us that is more like uh, what Heidegger is calling shikta, not, uh, I mean, I want to say fate, not just history. Um, the destiny as something which can't be reduced to a mechanical pattern, but it's not actually so important that it can't be reduced to a mechanical pattern. That's just how it appears sort of provisionally in the current uh, circumstances as with that account given by Socrates in the Apology of Socrates. So that's just uh, some things to go on, which I will um, endeavor to uh, arduously bring out in a more direct form in the coming uh, episodes.